waking up to a self-induced nightmare, he realized what his sin had caused. And his eyes were suddenly opened to a new world that was going to constantly be stained by his sin. And the consequences for what he had done would affect himself and everyone around him for the rest of his life and then even on into history, his legacy was stained, tarnished forever. And his shame was immediate. He was ashamed of what he had done, and it, it was so severe, he, he was ashamed of, of who he was, and he wanted to stop being himself. And he did what we all do when we're ashamed of our sin. He hid, and he tried to hide himself and everything that reminded him of who he was. Now, our world may look more bizarre than Adam and Eve covering their gender in fig leaves in the garden, but the story really is no different. We just look and sound, maybe look and sound a little more sophisticated. But it's the same old story. Adam was ashamed of his sin, so he hides from God. And then immediately, as he's hiding himself, he wants to hide everything that reminds him that he is a creature, that he has been created. And that includes his gender. And we see this in our culture today. We see this hiding, and we see this trying to change who we really are, redefine who we are. And, and we do that because we don't, want to, we don't want to know who we are because we are designed in the image of God. And if we admit that, then we know we are accountable to God. So we don't just hide from God. We are trying to hide everything that reminds us that we were created by God. We are only new fools with more fashionable fig leaves of redefined biology that covers the very things that remind us God designed us. And for us to be all of what God designed us to be, we have to know what he designed us to be. And we see that in God's word. And this issue is an issue of God's authoritative word. We can't pretend that it's just generic morals and values in doing the right thing. It is an issue of God's word. Do you believe that God has authoritatively spoken about these issues? Do you believe that God has designed gender, sexuality, and marriage, that it is God who is the final authority on these things? Because if he isn't, then sure enough, it's a free-for-all. And we can redefine it according to our desires and our wisdom. But what has God said about these things? Specifically, what has God said about sexuality and marriage. Well, we see that in Ephesians chapter 5, in the section that we read, beginning in verse 31, Paul is culminating uh, this section on marriage where he begins to communicate and teach that marriage was designed specifically for the gospel and not vice versa. Marriage was designed to point to the gospel. Marriage must find its culmination in the display of the gospel. And we're going to talk about that in the next few weeks, but what does this have to do with sexuality? 
Notice verse 31, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Paul's quoting from Genesis chapter 2 verses 24 through 25 and we looked throughout the first few chapters of Genesis last week where God has created man in his image, male and female, he has created them. He has given them the same dignity as those created in his image. They have the same essence as humans created by God, designed by God. But Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, it, it literally is the consummation verse after God has created male and female. He says, therefore, in light of the creation, male and female, in light of the creation of gender, and notice there's gender all over this verse. Adam, a man, Eve, a woman, they become mother and they become father. And notice the purpose there. They are designed to send out men and women who will create more families. They will become a family to create more families. They will procreate. This is a part of what, what God says when he's talking about the image of God, when he says, be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth. That's what it means to be created in the image. We are created to rule and we are created to reign. And here, male and female are to bring forth more rulers throughout the world in families. But essential to this act is what we will call the marriage act, sex. And here it is, it is a part of what it means to fill the earth. This is what you do to fill the earth. This act leads to procreation among other purposes in marriage. But at the heart of this act is the display of what the marriage covenant actually is. It is a one flesh covenant. And this act displays what marriage is. You become one flesh. It displays the covenant in which you are in, a one flesh covenant, and it requires male and female. Now, this one flesh covenant is a holy covenant marriage between a man and a woman who commit. This is what they do. We, we commit to become one. We are two, but then we become one before God. And it is a holy covenant. So we, we describe marriage as a holy covenant, meaning it is a set-apart covenant where two people are set apart from the rest of the world. So your marriage vows to forsake all others. You are set apart to this one person. And you are committing to be one with this person. And as you stand before God and you make vows to become one with this person before God and other witnesses, he makes you one. And he sees you as one, one flesh. That's what the covenant is. And it's a commitment to become one in every way. This is why marriage involves a legal covenant before the state, before the government, whatever that looks like in various cultures, because you are saying to this person, I am binding myself to you in every single way, spiritually, physically, financially, legally, and it will cost me something to have to separate from you. I can't do that. That's why, and let's just say it, cohabitation is wrong because there is no commitment. There is no covenant there. And by the way, this isn't just something that young folks do. This is across the board. It's becoming even more common with older folks. Why should I get married again? It's going to hurt my tax status. What about our insurance? Well, you are not committing to that person in every single way. And it costs you nothing if it doesn't work out. It is a one flesh covenant to become one in every single way. 
A few months ago, we talked about divorce, and this is why divorce is so harmful and dangerous, and I encourage you to go listen to that. We try to be very, very careful what we're saying about divorce. But this is why Jesus would say what God, what God himself has joined together in marriage. Let no man separate, because when you do pull it apart, there's significant damage. So sex happens in the context of this one flesh covenant. Sexuality is designed for this one flesh covenant. It is to be reserved for the moment to become one in every way, literally every way. And to become one flesh outside of the one flesh covenant is to lie about the covenant of marriage. And this is why sex out of, outside of marriage is not a display of love. It's not a display of love. Love is a commitment to another person's good no matter what. That means you covenant with them if you're going to become one flesh with them because you actually love them. Sex outside of marriage is not love. So don't be fooled. But gender, sexuality, the purpose of marriage, we see here in the first part of the Bible, and we see here, it's all designed by God, not man. And I want to just emphasize that again. This is an issue of the authority of God's word. We are being trained to think about it apart from God's word and all kinds of other categories. But for the Christian, we come before God's word and we have to ask the question, do I really believe these things? At the heart of who I am and who God has created me to be and created us to be as male and female, in the context of a marriage covenant, gender, sexuality, all of it, do I believe this is what God has said? Because if it's not, again, it's a free-for-all. And sexuality can be designed according to whatever desires you have, if God hasn't said. What makes it right or wrong? Homosexuality, bestiality. If God hasn't said, then it can be defined however. If gender is not about God's design that we see here that is fulfilled in the context of marriage and this marriage covenant that God has designed, if if gender is not about, then you can change gender according to what you think and what you feel, how you dress, hormone blockers, surgery. You, You can change it if God didn't do it. If marriage is not defined by God, then there are no boundaries. There's no boundaries. Polygamy, adultery, there are no boundaries if God hasn't said. But it's a one flesh covenant between a man and a woman who are committing to one another in every single way. Now, here's what happens when we disconnect it from God's design we dehumanize ourselves. These are things God created for us as humans in his image. He designed them for us as humans created in his image. And so when we deviate from his design, we are literally dehumanizing ourselves. We are choosing to be less and function less than what God has designed. And that, that is the context in which you have to understand these things when you look at the world. It's not just opinion. It's not just self-expression. You look at, you're looking around in our day at a dehumanizing of the world around you. A world that says God has not surely said. And so when we think about things like LGBTQ, a lot of times we just go, well, that's stupid and that's bizarre. It's way more heartbreaking than that. It's heartbreaking because every one of those letters is a dehumanizing label that people are putting upon themselves and others. 
They are calling themselves less than what God had created them to be. Do you, do you get that? They're thinking of themselves. They're acting of themselves in less than what God has called them to be. It is not self-expression. It is less than God's design for self. Now, all sin is a choice to be less than what God has designed. And it's not just homosexuality. The Bible is clear about homosexuality. You trade the natural for the unnatural. Human for unhuman. It's, it, it's to be less than what God created. It also happens when a brother chooses non-human pixelated images on his computer. That is a dehumanizing of yourself. You're being less than what God called you to be. Or a sister who's discontent, looking for love and affection, chooses sex outside of a marriage commitment. That's less than what God created her to be. It should break your heart. When you redefine gender or you decide to be less than the human God designed you to be, that should be heartbreaking. And by the way, this is not the latest fad. Fidget spinners, slap bracelets, mullets to be trans. It's not just the latest fad. It is faddish. It's, 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 it's way worse than that. Because when a six-year-old boy is discipled to be a six-year-old girl by his parents, that is an abuse to the image of God. It's abuse is what it is. We would say to treat someone less than human is abusive, right? Well, that's what's going on in homes. Kids are being abused, treated less than human in forms of self-expression. And I dare say it's not about the kids most times. But now I'm moving away from the Bible according to my own opinions. But listen, this is a plea to, to be what God created you to be. And stop choosing to be less than what he called you to be. Less than yourself. And and it starts in the home with parents. Listen, the world is discipling your children in these ways. Do, Do not be fooled. I know you bought that phone to make life easier. It's making your child's life a lot harder. The images, the TikToks, they are being discipled to be less than what God created them to be. And so use it for communication, whatever, but don't be scared to pick that thing up and look at those texts. Don't let anyone treat your little daughter than less than what you want for her. Don't do it. Why would you do that? Oh, that's none of my business. Do you pay the bill? Are you a mother or a father? Pick that thing up. Look at it. And let me tell you, all of us, we may be shocked about what we see. We may be embarrassed by it. But do you love the child in your home created in the image of God? Listen, you got a lot of things that you want. You want to be successful at athletics, You want them to be successful at school. You want them having a great education. Do you want them to be less than human on their phone? I don't think so. Have some courage today, parents. Let's start discipling our children in the gospel and the ways of God. And it also means that we really have to love those of the LGBTQ community. And I mean really love them. Because what's coming from the church right now is just simply disgust. And by the way, we don't know how to talk about these things aside from little silly memes. That's not helpful 
Do you really love the image of God that you see around you? Do you really want to see God's glory displayed in those that are created in the image of God? Do you want them to experience God's design for them? Listen, sin is never satisfied by trying to give you more of what God has for you. No, sin wants to give you less but tell you it's more. And as you see folks struggling, as you struggle you have friends who are devastated by these things, do you love them? Do you love them? Do you want them to experience life as one created in the image of God? It is not a violation of their human rights. You are trying to protect what is human in their person and calling them to God's design. So let's be better. Let's love because ultimately it is about the gospel. Notice as the text continues. As Paul is talking about marriage, and and we're going to look at this in the next few weeks as he's talking about husbands who sacrificially lead and wives who submit and follow, he gets to the end and he says, this is profound. All of this is mind-blowing. But notice he says, this mystery is profound. Now, throughout the book of Ephesians, the mystery that Paul has been talking about is the mission of the church, that that all of the sudden, God is displaying what he has had in mind from the very beginning, and that is the church made up of Jew and Gentile who believe in Jesus, and in Jesus, they have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. They are of the same status as the Old Testament Jew. Even greater status in Christ the Gentile now has by believing the gospel. And he says that is profound. He's not talking about marriage being profound. He's talking about the gospel being profound. Notice it refers to Christ, the Messiah, Savior King, and the church, the gathering of every tribe, every tongue, every nation that believe in him. This mystery, God's mission and plan for the world is profound. It is mind-blowing. It is mind-blowing that marriage is about this mystery. It is mind-blowing that marriage is about the gospel. It's not just about you trying to be a good husband. It's not just about you trying to be a good wife. It is about the gospel, and that is mind-blowing, that marriage would picture forth Jesus' love for the church. So we talked about this last week. Even as Eve was given to Adam as one who provides what is lacking. She's not lacking. She provides what is lacking. In the same way, the the church is given to Christ. Remember, Jesus looks upon the church as the fullness of him. Ephesians 1.21, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, there's nothing lacking in Jesus, but he chooses that this mystery, the plan for human history, would be incomplete without the church. And so the same way when Eve is brought to Adam and he says, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, this is same of my same. Jesus says that about the church. He redeems her life and gives her his status and says, you will be same of my same forever and ever and ever. You will have my status. You will have my inheritance. You will be my bride forever. He says that to the church, all who believe in the gospel. And so when we we, we think, let no man, Jesus' words, let, let no man tear this apart. He himself is willing to be torn apart to make this covenant with his church. And the price of breaking the covenant is to be torn apart. Well, he's already faced that penalty and price and paid that for the church. So he can't be torn from the church. He will be one flesh with her forever because his flesh was ripped and torn and he endured the wrath of God forever. And this is why the marriage covenant displays the gospel. It is this one flesh commitment never to be broken. And this is why gender and sexuality meant for marriage is a gospel issue. 
Marriage is a gospel issue. It's about the gospel. So, so that which is designed for marriage is about the gospel. Gender was created for marriage, so gender is created for the gospel. Sexuality is intended for the marriage covenant, so sexuality is for the gospel. God designed these things to tell this fascinating story of his glory. And when we deviate from his design, we tell another story. You could say we tell a false gospel. When we think about the sexuality, gender, all of these things outside of the way God has designed, we're telling a false gospel. We tell a gospel that says Jesus doesn't delight in his bride. He has wandering eyes. We tell a gospel that says Jesus isn't faithful to his bride. He cheats on her. Jesus isn't into long-term commitments. He's into a hookup. Jesus isn't committed to her in every way. He's just testing her out before he makes a commitment. Those are go- you're telling a gospel. It's a false gospel, but you're telling a gospel when you say those things, when you live that way, when you don't make those commitments. The church isn't pure and chaste, shouldn't be. The groom isn't worth waiting for. That's when it gets that this isn't just about personal preference. My sex life is my business. No, it is Jesus' business, and it is a gospel issue. And you are proclaiming a gospel, whether it's a true gospel or a false gospel. But notice something else. We're going to talk about this in the weeks ahead. Marriage was designed for the gospel, not the gospel for marriage. That's why some of you are so discontent with your marriage. It's because your marriage was going to be the gospel to you. But that's not what it was intended for. Marriage is intended to display the gospel. Marriage wasn't intended for you. It was intended for Jesus. And so you're on a mission in your marriage to preach the gospel. And you got to change the way you think that. And you got to put the gospel first. But that is the solution for all of these issues. We are created for the gospel. And we must ultimately find our identity in the gospel. It starts with the gospel. Sexuality, gender, marriage, status, all fits under gospel. We can't flip any of that, or we're going to be confused, we're going to be frustrated, and we're going to be living lives in despair. We must find our identity and our purpose of who we are, our design and our destiny in the gospel. We must start there and work from there. If we're going to know who God created us to be and enjoy it, And this is the the problem with so much that's going on in our culture, is we've taken gender, sexuality, marriage status, and it has become identity. It has become the starting point. Our identity is our sexuality. I'm gay, I'm bi, I'm trans, I'm straight. And we identify as our sexuality. And this is why so many people are so broken and frustrated and mad. Because if you don't accept my sexuality, then you don't accept me. And there's something within us that says, God doesn't accept that deviation from his design. And so you live knowing God doesn't accept me. And that's why it's so heartbreaking. But sexuality, gender, marriage is meant to point to Jesus. It was never intended to be Jesus for you. It's to point to him. It's to display the gospel. And so if you're seeking to be defined by anything less than Jesus, it will never be enough. If you're seeking to be defined by your marriage status or even your sexual purity, and that's your identity, Maybe you look at others and say, that's not me. I don't do those things. I don't, think, I don't look at those things. I don't think that way. If that's your identity, it's still not enough before God. It's about you. 
And to be defined by a contradiction is to live in this sort of outcast, hated status. You hate yourself. You feel God's hatred for you. Even those of us who know sexual abuse. Because we live in a culture that defines our sexuality defines us and it identifies us, you begin to think that abuse identifies you because it's also rooted in who you are and the way you've been taught and the way you've been trained to think about sexuality and identity. And it carries over in marriage. You, you, you identify yourself in this way. Your sexuality identifies you. And then in marriage, you're to be identified with someone else, and you don't even know how in the world that's even possible because you've defined yourself another way. It makes marriage hard. It makes marriage difficult. And this is why as a church, we must continue to give a healthy view of sexuality in light of the gospel. Healthy view of sexuality in light of the gospel. And here's where it begins. And I want you to get this. The very things that we distort in sexuality, in marriage, sexual deviating from God's design, the very things we distort in those ways are the very things that redeem us. The things that we are meant to point to The gospel, a pure groom who is making his bride pure. That is our hope. But we're the impure bride. But that's also why it's good news. Because he's committed to us with his life. He gave his life for his church. The very things we we deviate from we're, we're, the things we distort are what redeem us. You see, the truth is God has designed a new covenant despite your sin. In light of your sin, he has designed a new covenant. Whatever sin you bring in here today, whatever thoughts you bring in here, whatever self-formed identity you bring in here, through behavior, action, sin, abuse, whatever it is, God has a new way, a new covenant. He set his love on a church that desecrated the marriage covenant. We heard in the song so powerfully and read the book of Ezekiel. God pursues his bride, who's a harlot, chased after other lovers. That's how the Bible describes us. We're not those who, by nature, love God and pursue him, so he pursues us. Even in our wickedness, even in our sin, in Adam in the garden, he blamed his wife. Jesus stepped forward and dies for his wife. To become one flesh with her, he takes on flesh and becomes her sin. Jesus becomes the harlot, the one who has desecrated the covenant. On the cross, every sin Jesus endures. Those sins in your, in your past, in your heart, those desires that you know Jesus, hate, or Jesus hates, God hates, God unleashed upon Jesus at the cross, his wrath upon those things to make a covenant with you. On the cross, he died for your sin, every one of them. He lived a perfect life in your place. He is raised, and if you believe in him, you are given his life. You are given his death for you, and you stand before him, male or female, with the same status of Christ. In Christ, you are forgiven, accepted, righteous as Christ is perfect. It's always been perfect. And I want you to feel that today. As you come in here, you've identified yourself maybe in some other way, something that haunts you, when you believe in Christ, the Father sees you as Christ. 
And many, if not most, of our thoughts and our actions about these things, they, 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 they contradict what God has designed for us. They, they contradict what it means to be human. As we said, it dehumanizes us. But here's the thing. When you believe in Jesus and you are seen in Jesus, God sees you as the perfect human Jesus. He sees you as the perfect display of his glory. And your past doesn't define you. The distorted ways in which you try to define yourself according to your desires, it no longer defines you. Jesus defines you. And so if you're here today, whether it's just some kind of form of self-expression, or maybe you're trying to hide internet history, what, what Jesus says to you is the same thing he said to Adam. Where are you? Where are you? It's time to come out. It's time to come out of hiding. Stop making excuses. Stop trying to, to fix this by your own strength. Stop look to, looking for more sophisticated arguments online that, that's going to help you feel better about who you really are. You don't know who you are. You're hiding who you are. And when you're trying to cover, when you're trying to cover up with self, that's all you're left with is self. And self doesn't save you. No, to be covered in self is to condemn yourself, and it will not save. Only when you are covered in Christ, you do not have to cover up who you are. He's already done that. And you don't have to be even more than human, because in Christ, you couldn't be more. In Christ, you couldn't be more of a son or a daughter. Ultimately, this is about the gospel. Believe the gospel today. Let's pray.